So my name is Peter Levy. Uh, I've been teaching at York College now for 30 years. I will admit I didn't know York from York, England when I first got here. I grew up in California and then went to college in New York and then settled there. I actually live in Baltimore, so I come up every day. I was once called a carpetbagger when I, uh, uh, there was a colleague of mine named Phil Avila who ran for Congress and I worked on his campaign, was writing his letters to the editor and his, I guess, opposition team called me a carpetbagger because I was criticizing the Republican congressman at the time. But, you know, I feel, so, but I came to this, I was saying before, um, I was interested in civil rights movement. I was interested in kind of taking my study of the civil rights movement north. Um, had done a study of a small town in Maryland called Cambridge, then did some work on uh, Baltimore. And I had started having students um, write senior papers for me about this. And the very first person to do so was probably, I'd say, early 1990s, a woman named Karen Rice, who's now head of special collections at York College. And she said, can I do an oral history of the revolts? And I never even knew they existed. You know, mm. York. I heard of Newark and Detroit, these are the usual kind of uh, candidates for when people talk about kind of the uprisings of the 1960s. But she said she had to do it anonymously, that she felt too scared to give the names of the people she was going to talk with. And I think she was largely talking with former members of the Newbury Street Boys. Yeah. Though she had been a jazz singer herself, so she was interested, she had uh, access to both the black and white community, which is I think is somewhat unusual in lots of communities, actually. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the first I heard, and then had a couple other students who did it probably post the Charlie Robertson trial, you know, so I really don't, uh, but I had, a, I had another student who had been a journalist, who went on to journalism, and she was one of the cluster of uh, reporters who uh, began to run the stories, it would have been in the anniversary, 1999, mm -hmm. um, that kind of coincided with um, I guess the DAs renewed interest in it. And my, from my outsider's perspective, that's when the community really started battling over whether this is a subject or not that should really be talked about in the open. I mean, yeah. the DA raised the case against Robertson and um, there was a lot of pushback against it. And I, as a historian, was like, no, I think this is interesting. And then I probably, around 2010, 11, I started digging it myself. So it was long after the trial itself was over. Oh, wow. But you had you were here, like you witnessed the trial, you got to sort of see it To a fervor. sense, except I mean, since I'm not local, I don't read the local newspapers, oh, okay. you know. I collected a file folder of them, and, and it was the days before stuff was digital as well. So, yeah. you know, I could go back and get that stuff. Um, you know, or maybe you know, digital newspapers start around 1991, so it's uh, maybe they were there, but I didn't get it. Um, yeah, and and I guess I knew it was taking place, but probably I was. Ironically, I was paying more attention. I was part of a 40th anniversary of a riot in Baltimore, so they had a riot in 1968. So just not the Freddie Gray thing. So in 2008, I was on leave and doing stuff on Baltimore, mm -hmm. and then I started thinking, well, could I write a book that talks about these subjects in general by comparing three different towns, like a small, middle town, middle sized, mm -hmm. big city. Um, so that's why I came to this. Yeah. So when you started doing your research on York, what what sources were you using? Where did you go to find? So first and foremost, the newspaper. I mean, that's what I, you know, it, it's, it certainly wasn't easy to access. I wish, I wish newspapers.com existed then. It's, I don't know if you know what newspapers.com yeah. is, but, uh, you know, then it was literally, it would be down at the local historical society going through a microphone reader like this, mm -hmm. and there's no index or anything. So that was one. Um, government sources, uh, there's, there was stuff in the, uh, state archives from the governor's papers reporting on stuff, state, state troopers reports, governor's reports. Um, FBI stuff was pretty useless. Yeah, I saw it. there was a big deal because it got unsealed recently, right? Or in the past. Yeah, I don't think the Lily Bell Allen stuff doesn't mean much. And then for me, the other source was um, the trial transcript. So I had the, I mean, I would argue probably my stuff of York, the main thing I had was. You actually had these, by then, the trial transcripts, which are a mess to work with. It's like 12, DVD, 12 DVDs, literally, with no index, or right? so you're oh. just kind of going through it. But, I mean, you're having the testimony of, of, of people, and from my perspective, that's as good as it gets, yeah. actually, you know, because um, you're having people say stuff. Now, not everything's talked about, because it's always got to be 
around the case itself. Um, actually, probably the second trial, but the trial not of Robertson, but the trial of, and now here's my names, I'm forgetting, the two mm. black guys who were charged of, of Oh, in the, in the Shad Yeah, uh, because there was a surprise witness. One of, the one of the brothers says, yeah, we were there and we shot. Yeah. You know, but it's that when he starts talking about the why. Um, there were some oral histories, both that I did, but then I also uncovered your college had this long oral history project, uh, but they'd never really been cataloged or hard to find and yeah. stuff like that. I um, had seen those in, in, in your sources, and I was like, where are these? I want to, yeah. Yeah, and so, one of them was with Bobby Simpson that was done, I think, in 89. So before, mm -hmm. before interest in it kind of cropped up yeah. again, and it was done by a local uh, uh, black student, I think, who had grown up in York. Yeah. And I, I found the responses that Bobby Simpson gave then were much more open and kind of, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, valuable. Then really what's taken place in the last 20 years where people start getting interviewed and start saying the same things over and over right. again. Right, yeah. Um, you, know, he, I, you know, I think he was talking more about the roots of the cause, you know, where this come from. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. people had gone off to war and they were vets and they would come back and and the system hadn't changed. It didn't seem to be changing. Um, yeah, so I found that was, I found that, you know, those, stuff like that confirmed what I had seen in other cities. Right. There was nothing new here, but it was nice to have yeah. kind of a, a person who was involved and at the time. And even 89, Bobby Simpson wasn't what he would be later on in the community. Yeah. Kind mm -hmm. of a leader of the black community who I think was a little more reticent to talk. At that point, at that yeah. Point, yeah. Yeah, so, well, and I guess that's, um, I mean, maybe if you can take us through sort of your research, n not just with York, but at, you know, in comparison to these three cities and what was going on across the country and how that, you know, sort of got us to the point where we are now. Jim, Jim McClure, you know, talks about, he has his sort of formula, right, about systemic poverty and racism plus, uh, well, I don't even remember what his formula was, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, this plus this equaled the, you know, kind of the riots, but. Yeah, so I probably agree with Jim. So, I mean, there's, there's a general kind of sense that comes right out of the Kerner Commission Report of 1968 that we were a country that was two societies, um, you know, one black, one white, and then just like one chapter after another that goes over um, whether it be housing, police, uh, job opportunities, um, education, all in which we had unequal societies. I think what was missing with that formula, the thing that I had some colleagues who helped me with this, uh, it, it still made a sense that there were these problems and then they just exploded. Um, and here's where I had the hardest time with York. Uh, but finding out that there actually were these local movements against that for years. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if it's just a, a, a sudden explosion. It's, it's, it's more rather that you have a community that has been protesting against these conditions. So to take York as an example, I mean, so people had identified um, the police as one of the primary sparks of most of the revolts, and, and that you know, makes it very relevant today as well. Um, and Mayor Snyder was notorious for wanting this canine force, and I knew that the canine force was something that um, was a point of aggravation, but to, to find out that, you know, four or five years before there were major protests against the canine force, that, mm -hmm. that there were calls to, to disband it, uh, there were calls for civilian review boards, and sometimes they made progress, but uh, by and large uh, African Americans in the community were such a small minority politically, uh, they really had no power to, 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 to change things. So I, to me, I would add that in any understanding or equation of understanding the revolts and what takes place because it's not simply conditions. It's, it's also um, attempts to address that and the white communities, I don't like using the word white communities because it's not uniform, but it's pretty uniform. Uh, just unwillingness to really respond constructively. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and so one of the things like you've asked about sources, you know, uh, the State Human Rights Council, or it might be called the Human Rights Commission, mm -hmm. um, held hearings in this city in the fall of, summer and fall of 1968. And they're, they're pretty searing hearings. I mean, it's like, 
you know, this is the summer before. Now there already was trouble. I mean, right. that's and, and some locals get confused because there actually were a series of things we could call revolts, but pretty clearly 69's the worst. Um, and basically saying, if you guys don't change anything, this place is going to explode. And I think York was in the sense of denial of, well, we're not Detroit, we're not Newark, we're a small town that gets along, um, or they just thought they had such power. Mm. Um, and, in some ways, I, th I think that probably proportionally the black community was much smaller in York than it was in these other cities. Mm -hmm. Or just the, the total size of the black community was, say, you know, smaller. So maybe you could have another city where, like Milwaukee or something like that, maybe they made up 10 or 15 percent, but 10 or 15 percent of, of a million people still, still is much more significant. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and I found that just really telling, you know, and, and there's, there, there seemed to be no political leaders locally. There were whites in the community, uh, but there, they weren't really political leaders as far as I can tell. I would give the newspaper credit. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I um, oh, I'm terrible with names. So I just did, it's a, I think it's the York Dispatch, or we have the Dispatch now. There's a, it was the Gazette and Daily, the Gazette and Daily. which became Thank the you. Daily Record. Yeah. So yeah. the Gazette and Daily was this old progressive newspaper. Now why it was, I don't know, but we can go back to the 40s and 50s. It's the only local newspaper to um, endorse Henry Wallace, who was this progressive candidate. Yeah. And I'm like, why York? You know, <laughs> I mean, everyone else is calling him a communist, and, and they're endorsed him. And they have a black reporter who's doing a lot of good reporting. I forget his name, but he actually leaves here ultimately and becomes a major newspaper figure in Oakland. Oh, wow. Um, and if I remember correctly, they wouldn't always even um, publish under his name. You know, it was kind of dangerous to him or maybe to his yeah. career. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, and there were other figures that I, I wish I had interviewed. Um, what's Myers' first name? I'm losing it. Um, so she's the black woman who desegregates Levittown. Oh, you know, it's right, from yeah. York. Um, um, not Daisy. Uh, it, was it, is, it is Daisy Myers, Daisy? yeah. So I, yeah. I, met his I met her daughter recently at a, at a function here. Yeah. Because a couple years ago there was a movie by George Clooney that came out and Daisy Myers' his figures hev heavily in it, kind of in the background. Oh. Um, and... You know, I would have loved to have talked to her because she came here from Virginia, moved here with her husband, and got it. She was really very highly educated. She had a master's from NYU, and she was working in the housing um, unit in the city, and just, you know, she complained about the discrimination. And, uh, and then, she, you know, eventually made her way to the education system. I think it did a pretty top job. But, yeah. you know, she was, she's a really kind of famous person from New York. York. Things are happening in New York, but that story wasn't known. It was much harder to get that out. I think it still is harder to get it yeah. out. Well, and that, we, we touched a bit on that. So Jim McClure was talking about, you know, the redlining and, and the, the different, you know, deeds and, and housing associations and the way that, that people were kept, you know, where they were and, and prevented from doing that. But do you want to, do you want to, like, tell Daisy's story just so we have the, the content of it? Yeah, and then, if you know, so yeah. as far as I remember Daisy Meyer's story, she's from Virginia and she marries Frank. So her, I don't think her maiden name is Myers. She marries Frank Myers, who I think is from York or from this area, lived here, and then moved, if I remember correctly, they moved to Levittown. So Levittown is the epitome of, mm -hmm. of white, of, of, of the suburbs, you know, and, and, you know, the treatment Daisy Myers gets in Levittown should be as famous of a story as Rosa Parks in, in Montgomery. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it leads to this confrontation. Essentially, they're ultimately forced to to really move out and she moves back to York and she, you know, she can, she, it's not as strictly segregated as Levittown, but on my sense is she probably couldn't have gotten a house in the suburbs of New York at the time, you know, uh, yeah, no uh, he, she ultimately, I think settles in Red Lion or Dallas town though. So she and does move there, but, uh, then she gets employment, if I remember correctly, she, she gets employment here and faces discrimination and quits the housing department there. Um, she had, as I said before, a master's in education, and at one point she did move into education. Mm -hmm. So there were opportunities, I think, by the early mid-70s for African Americans within the education system. But I think in many ways they were somewhat um, limited prior to that. Yeah. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, you know, that just, you touch on that, it's like, you know, you should have like a historical market. This is, they, they really should. This is where Daisy Myers is from, and at least tell. Now Levittown, finally, 50, 60 years later, is recognizing Daisy Myers. Really? But it took some while for them to do that. Yeah. There always were members in the community. It's close to a Quaker community, and the Quakers supported her and who bought the house that she moved into, yeah. essentially, or worked with her. Um, 
But you know, she just she helps you understand that housing story, I think, better. Was there a sense in your research that in York, you know, you talk about them saying, okay, well, we're not Detroit, we're not, you know, some of these larger cities that are having these issues. Besides the Human Relations Commission telling them there was a problem, like, was there an awareness that this stuff was going on? Um, I think people would feign ignorance, but I think, of course, you know, I mean, there's, there are protests. It's, yeah. in, you know, it's in the newspaper. So there's that. What there's one story where um, God, I'm terrible with names. The publisher of the Gazette and Daily has lunch with mm -hmm. Schmidt, who's like one of the big scenes of the city at the Lafayette Building, and the newspaper had run an expose of the housing conditions in the city, and Schmidt saying, I should remember his name, the newspaper publisher, uh, is saying. God, I can't eat my breakfast. You know, this, you know, you're upsetting my ability to enjoy my day with this story. And the response of the publisher was then change the housing. Yeah. You know, so there were investigations of it. Um, when I did oral histories, maybe they're feigning it. And I would ask about police and I would ask about the dogs. Yeah. It's probably pretty similar to today. I think. You know, people who I have no reason to think are just total racists have total different memories of the police and the dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the dogs were protection or they remember them coming into their schools and showing off with the cops. And this was a period when police dogs and, and would come in, police dogs and policemen would come into schools. And I forgot it was like Captain Friendship or whatever they call it. Officer you know. Friendly. Off, officer, yeah, friendly officer Friendly. And yeah. So because they were never being attacked by the dogs. Yeah. You know, I think, you, you, so you, know, you have the episode, I think after one of the football games where kind of this mini revolt takes place and the dogs are being set loose on young black people because the white people, they didn't have that similar experience with the dogs. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, even the white gangs well, I'm not sure if the police owe, my sense is the relationship between the police and the gangs is probably on again, off, on again, off again. You know, when the revolts take place, they're clearly siding with them, but maybe at other times they saw them as just a bunch of juvenile delinquents. I can't, you know, I can't tell you that. You know, yeah. Maybe I'm flavored too much by West Side Story. <laughs> kind of their officer cruckies with, you know, these gangs just stop it. But, but. Yeah. Um, I don't know of any case where they went after them with the dogs. Right. You know, for probably equal, or if not worse, um, kind of disruptive behavior, yeah. teenage behavior, basically. Yeah. So that you know, that's one place where clearly you see this people reading the world differently through oral histories. Um, So even when Jim talks about redlining, I mean, there's a big discussion of that. How how aware are people of redlining, of uh, this, these whole FHA programs that only certain people could get mortgages? That's I think that's still kind of debated among scholars. Clearly, I think most scholars would say people knew, but what may be more important is they need to understand in retrospect that they had these privileges. And what they've tended to do instead is naturalize these differences and say, they, they, they just say, well, blacks live in poor areas and they come up with these cultural explanations mm -hmm. rather than there were these policies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the crucial thing is, um, one of the people I work with is this woman named Jean Theo Harris who's done just really great stuff on Rosa Parks. She's in, in New York City. Um, and she really hates the, the term uh, de facto versus de jure segregation. So I think we have this notion that somehow in the South there's this de jure, this legal segregation. There were these policies that established us. Yet in the North, it just happened that way. And now, so if we go back and we realize, no, there were these FHA loans, there was this redlining, there were, um, people will find it, these uh, covenants and people's mortgages. Mm -hmm. Even if they weren't valid, they, they were steering that took place. And I also like to talk about it both in terms of what I call omission and commission. There's things you do, there are policies you are doing, but there's also things you're not doing. So the community knows there's housing segregation, knows there's job discrimination. What are the leaders doing to try to overcome that? If we really believe like all citizens should be treated equally, we need, we need laws to try to um, make everyone be treated equally. Yeah. So I, sometimes the omissions, you know, it's happening and we just kind of come up with these other explanations. So she, her view is, she's actually edited a book called The Strange Career of the Jim Crow North. Um, 
because Jim Crow always existed in the North. Doesn't mean it's exactly the same as the South. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I were to be really controversial, and I was in a paper after I wrote this book. <laughs> um, so lynching is becoming something people are looking at mm -hmm. pretty seriously all over the country. I don't know if you know Brian Stevenson, this guy who does the book. The movie just came out about him. Um, God, hey, simple justice. Uh, but so he's got this um, lynching. That's not what's called. Okay, it's a memorial and museum in Montgomery. It's incredible. It's the best museum you can go to in the country. I'm telling you, really incredible country. place. <laughs> and so in the museum, because they don't want to be vicarious, um, they have a pitcher, strong word, a jar with the dirt of where every lynching took place in America. But at this point, it's just southern lynchings. We know lynchings took place of African Americans in the North. I would argue Lily Bell Allen's was a lynching. You know, that, that's what her sister said. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a white mob and people knew. And then it was covered up. Um, there's a woman who's done studies of lynchings on the Eastern Shore of Maryland and says, you know, if we look at the memory of lynching, the black community's memory of a lynching and the white community's memory of lynchings is totally opposite. The whites there, they forget about it, they don't talk about it. And for the black community, it's, it's, it's riveted and it's, it, cause that's what it is. It's a moment of terror meant to scare people. Yeah. And so if we go back to kind of Charlie Robertson stuff, the black community is saying, yeah, let's look at this. And the white community is saying, no, let's not look at this. Um, and I think the white community's response to the verdict in the Shad murders is, oh, we've kindly finally got justice. And at least a good part of the black community is saying, no, we didn't. We didn't. It was an unfair system. Charlie Robertson had high representation. You know, he, he, and 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 on top of it, why did it take so many years to even get him in the court in the first place? People knew they were electing this guy mayor. That's, well, that's one of the things I was going to ask you because we um, kind of like what you just said. So like they knew this had happened and this was talked about for years, but still became mayor. Like, no matter what the past was or anything like that, they let it go and then just decided, like, okay, yeah, we're going to pick this guy. So, with what kind of things that you wrote about and stuff that you talk about, memories being, like, whatever you make them, right? So, that's what, how do you feel, as though, like, when you're talking to people and you're interviewing people, like, do you see that? Like, there's just selective history, like, where we just, like, pick certain things, like, we want to remember and, and, and other things like that. There's just, like... Uh, you know, you don't always say black and white, but like what we're talking about now, like you're saying like white, white, white people view it this way, and they're saying like this is that, ah, it happened, okay, let it go, and then the, the trauma is still there for some. Yeah, I, I, so I think the problem is Yorkers actually are really sensitive and think it's only happened here. <laughs> I mean, that York is just an illustration of what's taking place across American history in lots of communities. Um, I originally, my book wanted a chapter on memory, and I just couldn't write it. Mm. I, I, I couldn't figure out what my argument was. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure out what my argument was. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, so one of the questions, you know, because you, you know, we're in a period like where all of a sudden, for example, civil rights history is gigantic. The, I think it's awesome that the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C. is like, you have to get tickets to go, it's so popular. Um, back in Montgomery, I am certain that the government of Montgomery wasn't excited when they say we're going to have a lynching memorial. It is turning that city around. Literally, like, probably if we were to get together with kind of the Sions of York and say what we really need to do is we need kind of a museum of northern racism and it should be in York. Not because York had it worse than other cities, but because you know, why not? You know, yeah. Gettysburg had a battle and Lancaster had, mm -hmm. you know, James Buchanan or something <laughs> like that. And, you know, just why not? It's on the trail, you know. Yeah. And um, I don't think there'd be that much support on, you know, I, I, people don't really want to talk about the traumatic stuff. I mean, it is traumatic. Trauma's hard to deal with. The white community doesn't want to talk about it. They would, they're like, let's be boosters. Let's only show the good, the good stuff. That came out right from the moment I first started this book, which was 40 years ago almost, when I went to Cambridge, Maryland, a town I had never heard of, and the first person I interviewed was this state senator, a guy named Frederick Malkus. If you've ever been down to like 
the Eastern Shore, mm -hmm. and driven across the bridge. You drive across the bridge with his name. So mm -hmm. this guy was like a big wig for 40 years. He says, why would you want to peel that boil back? Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to talk about something that's uncomfortable? Where the black community was much more comfortable talking about, actually not so much the right they had, but um, th this vibrant civil rights movement that had existed in this city. And they wanted that story told. Mm -hmm. And now it's like that's coming out. Harriet Tubman has a museum about her now. There's some Gloria Richardson. I think yesterday was Gloria Richardson Day in the state of Maryland. Oh. Maybe we should have Lily Bell Allen Day yeah. in the state of yeah, yeah, in the state of state of Pennsylvania, or Daisy Myers Day in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, well, and that's really interesting too because I've only ever heard it framed as you know the riots, but never as like York's civil rights movement. Yeah. It's never it's never From presented that through way. that lit through that lens, you know. And I have to be careful because you know I tried to use the word uprising, uprising in the title, yeah. and revolts. I fall back into riots because it's just a language well, people use. But I but I, I would I'd actually prefer not because I think once again riots make it like this this single spontaneous moment rather than part of a continuum. Yeah, yeah like lots, riots just sound like reactionary yeah. rather than revolt sounding like, not just reactionary, but it sounds like, to me, revolts have a purpose. Yeah. Whereas yeah. riots... Well, an like, uprising yeah. has that, you know, metaphorical... Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so yeah. one of the other colleagues I, 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 I work with is a guy who's looked at uprising internationally or revolts internationally. So if I said to you the name like the the uprising in Warsaw, or the revolt in Warsaw, they understand, well, this was an uprising, kind of the Jews in this ghetto before they all got decimated by the Nazis. Yeah. And people don't see it as, oh, a bunch of kids go through the street and start looting, building, building, burning buildings without any reason whatsoever. Right. Yeah. Oppression. Yeah. 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 And it is a continuum, too. Yeah. And, and, and you all thought that's... It, what comes afterwards? I think the other problem is so often we, we get this image of, of the first time I taught a civil rights course. So, I, you know, I'm still, in the, I'm still getting educated, okay? My students are still educating me. Uh, so this was 19, mid-80s, late-80s. And I taught a course in Rutgers, at Rutgers, Newark. I was teaching there at the time. And we kind of got to the very end of the civil rights course. Um, and I said, let's talk about the, the, the Newark, and I called it riots. And some student in class, it wasn't me fortunately, said, well, why did the blacks burn down their own city? And you could still see the scars in Newark of their 1967 revolt. Fortunately, well, the black students in class said, well, wait a second, you know, and started talking about it. Um, but I think even that argument has been accepted by parts of the black community yeah. as well without interrogating why that took place. Mm -hmm. And there was actually a moment in Newark after the revolts where not all life fell apart. In fact, blacks began to gain political power. Blacks began, they actually stopped um, a medical center from being built, which would have been further urban redevelopment, which, which would have displaced even, even more blacks. Mm -hmm. And they make the argument that much of the violence, if not a lot of it, came from the police. You talk about stages that took place that kind of once the police got so angry, they just started wantonly shooting people. Um, the movie Detroit 67 is awful, but at least it focuses on this terrible tragedy at the Algiers Motel. You know, what it doesn't do is give any background of what was happening in the black community leading up to it. You know, the, I don't know if you've seen Detroit 67. I haven't seen it. But I mean, the beginning there's this riot, there's this raid on a, um, I forgot what they call it, but since an after hours nightclub. It's big easy. Yeah, it had a different name. I forgot what they were called in Detroit or something. But anyway, you know, they were regular. They couldn't get a liquor license past 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, what they don't tell you is that this was a place where political mobilization had been taking place for years. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just some place to hang out. You know, so the police were raiding something, not just because people were drinking late and dancing. Mm -hmm. This was a place where people were mobilizing politically. And Detroit's another city where blacks gained political power after the revolt rather than... I'm, I'm going astray here. So the other memory that's really different really different. Um, whites generally have the memory that everything went crappy in the city after the, the riots. The riots caused white flight. Um, which is just, all you have to do is graph population and see that the population of the city was its highest in the 50s. It remained kind of stable, but only because the black population continued to grow, but the white population was declining at the same rate from 1950 to 1970 as it did afterwards. And, you know, unless everyone moved out 
from July of 69 to the time the census was taken in January 70, which didn't take place. So yeah. that's their memory. And same type of thing with like downtown shopping. They, you know, there's this nostalgia about all the downtown shopping when in fact they were already making these shopping centers in the suburbs because that's where the customers preferred to shop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's true in every city. Uh, in Baltimore, it's even worse in some ways because there was this row of famous department stores. But York had that, where people have these memories of going downtown and, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you know dressing up. And but those stores were already starting to be kind of economically not less profitable, more more marginal. Mm -hmm. uh, and housing, same thing. Um, you know, that's when housing values started to fall. Probably, my guess is like the poor whites who were already feeling maybe some of that pressure were already. The economy was doing well in general, but probably if we look at it at a granular level, we already start seeing slowdowns. Yeah. yeah. Um, the study of, probably the best study on this is done on Detroit. It's, it's called the Origins of the Urban Crisis. And so, you know, the GM looks like it's doing gangbusters throughout the 1960s, but in fact, their factories are moving to the newer factories in the suburbs. African Americans disproportionately have a hard time getting there because it's all an uh, automobile culture, there's no public transportation out there. They're already in the lower skilled jobs, you know, they, they haven't been able to move up as easily to the foremans and management. So whites, once again, Detroit have this memory of the riots destroying Detroit, when in fact it was already an incredibly distressed city, and I think York's the same way. Well, so we talked about uh, earlier with Jim about the, uh, what did you guys call it, the, uh, help me out here. What? The right. meeting that they had. Oh, the charrette. The charrette. Yeah, the, we charrette. Had the charrette. It led to public transportation kind of helping like, others get jobs and stuff that didn't have transportation like outside of the city. So it was kind of the same, uh, what you're talking about, like what happened in Detroit, where they were able to get these other means of transportation and stuff to find other opportunities, but still weren't always I mean, afforded to them. I guess I say. Yeah, and I, yeah, and, and the timing is not just coincidentally bad. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like what people are talking about the last recession. Blacks finally start building up some home equity and what we know now is that the recession hurt blacks disproportionately worse than it did whites because they were the ones who were being preyed on most by the banks and so the wealth gap has just increased. It's, 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 it's so that when the recession started to hit in the early 70s, blacks haven't accumulated the wealth to weather that recession as well or to make the transition as easily to a new economy. Um, and I, I, I think whites just have no, no, no understanding of that by and large at all of the, the, the delay. Um, another thing I thought was really interesting, and then my husband laughed at me because I didn't know it, um, but you brought up earlier that your family is from South Carolina. You were, your family's part of that, that great migration. And that was, that was something I, I thought was really interesting. So I'd like to get that just out in, in content here in terms of the pr pretty much two counties, right, within in South Carolina. I'll let you tell it because I'm not good at it. But um, wh where people came from. Yeah, I mean, I think it's true in most northern cities. There's a chain migration, and it tends to be from somewhat specific place. I mean, the most famously known is like Mississippi moving to Chicago, and it's kind of in St. Louis. That's why the blues and jazz is good in Chicago. <laughs> um, so Bamberg County is one of the two. Um, so it's not accidental. You know, Lilybell Allen's coming up from kind of the ancestral homeland of the place where a lot of famous, not a lot of families lived here. Um, and not just York, she's actually on the way to Brooklyn to visit her brother and thinking about moving there permanently. But she has deep roots in South Carolina. So, you know, so I start off with that story because it just, it just kind of like, to me, grabbed me and said, start this way. You know, there's these famous lynchings in South Carolina, two of the most famous in American history. I just learned yesterday that Orson Welles actually had a famous rodeo, radio program about one, of, about one of them. I didn't even know about him. I knew that Woody Guthrie had written a song about it, but um, this guy, Sar Sergeant Woodward, who, who was blinded by the sheriff um, oh. as a veteran right after the war. Oh. So there's a famous one in the 20s, and then there's a famous one right after the war. So technically, it's not a lynching. He's not killed, but he's a veteran, and some white takes exception to that. You know, you're in your uniform and blinds him, and the sheriff gets off. You know, and then to come to a city and then essentially have this, you know, with the, maybe these expectations that things are better in the north and the conditions really aren't that much different. Yeah, um, yeah so I don't, I don't know what else. I, I think maybe my guess is that that probably 
uh, to a certain extent, to help the African American community have a greater deal of the resistance. That you know, you, you so you know there is a sense of community within the African American community. It's not just people coming from all over. I mean, this is a story of any migrant group. I mean, when my grandfather died at I don't know age ninety two or ninety three, my dad was out of the country, and I had to go, um, you know, help take care of her. And she still remembered her husband moving her to the Polish neighborhood. She was Jewish Polish, but that was like, no, wrong neighborhood, you know. <laughs> she wanted, and ultimately within two years, it was, you know, she had 13 brothers and sisters and cousins around. You know, I, I think that was part of the strength that I wish I knew more about. I think Ophelia's doing an incredible job of recapturing that history, you know. And interesting, she's an outsider, you know. Yeah. Um, Evidently, you guys are doing the same thing, you know, kind of recapturing that history and saying there was a there was a community. They built churches, you know, within schools. There were, you know, these, this group, the players that used to do performances. Yeah. And there were probably tons of other things that, you know, I don't know about that. You know, if, if I had another twenty years to write the book, I'd probably spend more time doing that because I think that's really crucial too. Yeah. Had you done much um, on the, what is that, the Cadoris neighborhood? Is that what it's called? Yeah, not as much, yeah. Okay. Not really much post. Yeah. yeah. I had, um, mm. I watched a video uh, just maybe last night or two nights ago. I had no idea there was, um, there was a, a, a black neighborhood in Manhattan called Seneca, Seneca Park or Seneca Hills that was decimated to build Central Park. And it was, you know, at that point in Manhattan, everyone was living in lower Manhattan. And, you know, due to that systemic racism and poverty, people started moving north. And they created, I mean, they had schools and churches. And, and uh, they did an archaeological dig to show that they had nice pottery and pipes. And so it wasn't, you know, some shanty town kind of neighborhood. This was a mm -hmm. middle class, thriving, not only black neighborhood, but then... Um, they were able to show that other immigrants moved in and there were interracial marriages and it was sort of this experiment and in hmm. integration and then when it came time to build central park they just you know they were like this area gone and you know took it out to, so to this build is a like park. 19th century stuff. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Late, like but early watching that reminded me i i had no idea that there was a neighborhood over there at, at bands park and yeah so i think there were two that were kind of taken down for renovation well, not renovation, yeah, urban yeah, renewal. Yeah. Um, and you, so, yeah, I did that. I one, don't know how, I mean, so that, when people talk about it, they talk about a sense of community. Everyone knew everyone in the neighborhood. It's easy to see it as nostalgic, but I think there's a certain degree of truth about that, yeah. you know. And, and people married each other, went to school together. And so when you disrupt that, I think that has an impact. And um, that, I mean, that there at college in Penn, is essentially would have been the border of, of where that neighborhood was, right? And that's where a lot of that, I mean, kind of the unrest. Was, I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> well, essentially there were t two African-American communities. That was one, and then over on King Street, I believe there was a, a cluster as well. Okay. Um, I mean, it was not evenly dispersed. I mean, so I can't remember whether I included it, but I have got a really bad map of the racial geography. Oh, in York, yeah, and, okay. and I can't remember whether I was able to include that in there. I don't mm -hmm. think so. Yeah, I had that I somewhere else. Um, it's actually, I had a student try to do this GIS map, and he didn't do that good of a job of it. But <laughs> um, I can't do that stuff. But uh, but it was you know it's there's really a, a so like Newbury Street. It's there's a there's a racial divide there. Yeah. But just as importantly, there's whole parts of like West York and uh, and. And kind of way down in Market Street, where it's 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 virtually all white as well, and then the suburbs, particularly, it's very very pronounced. Yes, yeah. And that's true pretty much everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I live in I said Baltimore. I actually live in Baltimore County, which is today probably one third of the county's African American. I think probably half the schools are, but not in 1968. I mean, it was it's a I don't know if you know anything about the area down there. Baltimore County is like this horseshoe around the city. Yeah. And, yeah. When did they draw those lines? <laughs> uh, it's actually even earlier than that. I mean, I, people even within the city that these this, this city is still very segregated. Yeah. So when you come back now, um, you said like you travel back and forth every day. So you're here every day. What do you feel? You know, the, with the divide and you see like the I guess like all the businesses opening up downtown and, and those types of things, they feel they're trying to trying to welcome like all aspects in. Do you still feel like the divide's still there or 
you know, I, I was part of a panel, I think it was part of a three-part panel that Jim McClure and some mm -hmm. other people were putting together, and we were focusing on housing. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Dominic Della Carpini is very interested in kind of looking at the issue of housing to the point that he's got this cluster of students and we're going to, or he's going to, I might go on when I'm going, like some road trips to maybe similar towns to kind of see how do you deal with this housing, this housing problem. So I think there's probably some well-meaning people. I just don't know if there's a model out there for how do you, you want economic development and do without just displacing people. Mm. And we know we need to get to that model. It, you know, this, the solution to a city is not, let's just revive business and move all the people who can't afford to live there anymore. I grew up in San Francisco. People don't realize San Francisco once had probably 15, 20 percent African-American population. I don't know if you've seen the strange movie that came out called The Last Black Man in San Francisco. It came out last summer. It's worth watching. No, really weird yeah. film. You know, it just, it just, you know, whole black communities just have disappeared mm -hmm. in San Francisco. I don't think that's the model we want at all. Well, yeah, talked, New York's the same way. We were part of a group um, talking about like realigning different businesses. And there's like, if you kind of don't count the downtown area, there's really nothing else like outside of it, like anywhere else. Um, Commerce or business-wise, yeah. 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 So there's just all like everything in, in the city. It's kind of just like right where we're sitting and within a mile, like this way or this way. Um, and that's kind of, we, we talked about like people maybe feeling some exclusion from certain places and that because of crowd and the atmosphere and that, do you think that still creates like a bigger divide as far as like even financially or? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the old problem of, so once again, I'll come back to Baltimore, what I know of Baltimore. You go to Baltimore, people go to the Inner Harbor and, you know, a lot of good that did to the neighborhoods of Baltimore. Baltimore has 200 different neighborhoods. It didn't filter out to east or west Baltimore, yeah. you know, so you can have this, you know, so the best of all possible worlds, York will eventually be like an Inner Harbor and will attract visitors and it will look like this gleaming city, but in fact go not a mile. In Baltimore, no, you just need to we go were, 15 blocks. We were just yeah. there, uh, mm -hmm. May, something like that? Yeah. We went to the Edgar Allan Poe house, and it was just funny because where it's at, and you're just, you're in the city. Like, you're you're right in it. And then you walk, you know, four blocks, and then the harbor's right there. <laughs> but you're standing just, in the middle of the project. But you're, so you're, you're looking, yeah, you're you're looking right. in the projects, and if yeah. you do like this, you can see the harbor from, mm -hmm. from, the, from the street. But there's nothing in between, like you said, so. And it, it, it's a incredibly divided city. The, the only thing it's, and I don't know York's racial geography as much, is the gentrification in Baltimore actually has by and large taken place in white neighborhoods. It just so happened that the white working class used to live in the waterfront. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if you ever saw The Wire, but yeah. the second yeah. season of The Wire is yeah. on Locust Point. Yeah, It's all white, it's all poor, there's, yeah. even, there's even references to these condos that they can't afford. Mm -hmm. And still all white by and large, white gentrification. Maybe there's some middle upper class blacks moving there. But in fact, the nicest housing in the city is probably what's called Druid Hill, which is closer to the zoo. Yeah. But it's not, now it's not by the water. And people want water right now. But um, I also think there's kind of this mindset of kind of white young people, they don't want to move in there either. Mm -hmm. There's probably some displacement taken around John Hopkins Hospital. I mean, that may be the one exception. But by and large, it's toward the water which had historically been the white community. So, like, um, so, and so, and so far as communities get affected, you know, so beyond just the downtown, because mm -hmm. there are communities that are doing well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, East and West Baltimore have seen nothing in the last 50 years in terms of well, community I mean, development. You cross the bridge, um, going past the Cadores, and oh, it's kind of the same yeah. thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. You got the market, and then once you go, past just the, the avenues, yeah. pretty much, just yeah. like the only yeah. further out there. Well, and what we've what we've been seeing, and I don't even know. I mean, maybe even past decade is a rise in our Latino population, um, which I don't know is that is that happening in Baltimore too? Is that is that something that's happening in? in I think it's happened a lot more here. Yeah. You know, probably is, is my guess is you're probably as plurality learned Latino right now. I may be wrong about that. Yeah, the last census is, you know. Yeah, it's it's cl it's very close. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Baltimore is, has a relatively small Latino population for a big city, I mm -hmm. think. Whereas they tend to be more in the suburbs, you know, kind of the inner suburbs of cities, is my understanding. Yeah. Um, I have a colleague who's Peruvian. Uh, and he has an apartment in Prince George's County outside D.C., and it's very similar there. So there's large, large Latino population in Prince George's County, which is, I think, the largest African-American suburb. 
county in the country um, where whites won't touch that, you know, kind of, I mean, he, he's, he's a great place. You know, it's a lot of vibrancy, <laughs> yeah. new young businesses. I mean, I actually, I, that, to me, that is the story that's still untold about York, which is the Latino story. Mm -hmm. um, historically, to me, cities are doing well if they're attracting migrants. And so even in terms of housing, this is where I'm kind of divided what happens to take place in housing. Probably York, like Baltimore, the problem is uh, not that there's not enough housing. It's probably, we probably have fewer houses now than you did 50 years ago, you know, places have fallen down or into disrepair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of evidence that denser neighborhoods are safer. Hmm. There's a famous study of Chicago, like the biggest killer in Chicago was a famous heat wave. And it found out the neighborhoods that were dense, people didn't die because you knew your neighbor and everyone knew. And it was kind of the neighborhoods that had abandoned buildings on them and people didn't walk out and they didn't feel safe. Or, like broken windows theory. Yeah. About, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and so that, yeah, and if you go back to your old sense of community, you know, if, if you had kind of a community and people were living all together and they weren't out in their cars and, but it's not even just the broken window. So Jane Jacobs is probably the most famous urban person and you know, she, she was so against urban redevelopment and, and this idea of having cities with big avenues and things like Lincoln Center. She wanted, she, I think, you know, if you've ever been to Europe, her image is these small European villages where you, know, you got your market there and this and everyone knows each other and that mm -hmm. sense of community. Um, how we do that in a place like York, I don't know. I'm trying to find American cities that have done that successfully. They probably are out there in, you know, in pockets. We don't, if we think of it at the community level rather than the city level, we need to find out how they've done that. Yeah. You know, there may be certain anchors. So is that, so what are you working on now? Or what are you, what are your focuses now? I guess I'm interested. So I actually, I, I write in a paper called Who Killed Ralph Featherstone? So, uh, there was this famous black radical, H. Rep. Brown, and he was to be tried for inciting a riot in Cambridge, Maryland, but the trial had been moved uh, the day the trial was supposed to, the night before the trial was supposed to stop. Uh, a bomb blew off, killing two of his colleagues. Mm -hmm. Right from the beginning, there were two different narratives of what had happened. So this is in a, a period where there's a wave of bombings. Probably the most famous one had taken place a couple days ago, a couple days before, where these white new leftists had blown themselves up in a, in a uh, Greenwich Village townhouse. I think it was owned by Dennis Dustin Hoffman or something like that. So it was really headline news. Yeah. So the two different narratives, well, they had the bomb, they intended to do this nefarious stuff and they killed themselves. They blew themselves up. And the other narrative, all the black community saying, oh, these guys were assassinated. Uh, they thought H. Rap Brown was in the car and were trying to kill him. So this is 19, early 1970, before anyone had heard of COINTELPRO. Anyone had heard about the, you know, the assassination of Fred Hampton, or maybe, you know, maybe in the community there was discussion, but there was no public acknowledgement of it. Um, I was able, to, after doing an FIA, FOIA kind of request, finally get Featherstone's files. I can't prove he was assassinated. I just don't have that stuff. What I can prove is the government really wasn't that concerned with solving the case. Yeah. What it was more concerned about was hiding the identities of thousands of confidential informants it had everywhere of making sure news of COINTELPRO didn't get out. Um, so I'm also interested in media representations of it. Um, the Washington Post reporter who writes the first stories, Carl Bernstein of the Bernstein Woodward mm -hmm. fame, um, it's a terribly racist article. It's mm -hmm. like, these black militants, he's been to Cuba, he's anti-Semitic, which really translates into he's pro-Palestinian. Um, so, so it just it frames the reader's view that yes, this guy is a guy who blew himself up with a bomb. He's a um, what's the word they use for it? Um, disillusioned black militant who's turned to guerrilla warfare, basically. Wow. You know, when in fact he was working at this black bookstore in Washington D.C. called Drum and Spear, which is in the late '60s, early '70s. One thing the black community started doing was having these black businesses, one were black bookstores, where they would bring black speakers in and sell black books because the yeah. white community, and Drummond Spears, one of the two or three most famous in the country, was like, you know, and, and that's what he had turned to, you know, okay. He had, he had opened a catfish cooperative in Mississippi and was working at a black bookstore. Now, maybe he was ultimately in favor of kind of revolutionary change, but as far as I can tell, bombing was never part of it, yeah. you know, so 
to me, it's kind of interesting. Wow, yeah, that's very I, interesting. Unfortunately, I can't get the answer I want. I really had hoped when I found his no, FBI file, you know, oh, yeah. this, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. anyway. But that seems, I mean, a lot of what we've been seeing and, and talking about, too, is that idea of, you know, let's not, we've already had this incident happen, let's not ruffle any more feathers, let's kind of, you know, smooth things over, and... Or take the first thing you read is the gospel, well, like yeah. it's been, yeah. But in some cases, I mean, I think we were lucky here to have the media representation and asking the questions that, that they did do, although probably not every, well, I know not everyone felt that way. That well, was a good thing. Or so, you know, if I were to come full circle on it, the big question is, imagine if York had had a black newspaper. Yeah. Would it have reported it differently? You know, would the story have died down? You know, would yeah. we have more of a history? As, as good as the Gazette and Daily is, and it's in financial trouble by the end of the 60s as well. Yeah. You know, and, that, and we got to think about that kind of, it's not just the newspaper and the publisher, but kind of the p political economy of publishing, yeah. you know, of, of what news gets told. Um, and people, and, and, and they're getting, the, the editor knows, the publisher knows, you know, you publish stuff, you're losing viewers. You're, yeah. losing, you're losing subscribers. And they have this rival newspaper that is just awful on the issue. Yeah. Um, so if there had been a black newspaper here, because... You know, that's, that's true, I think, throughout history. We would like that source. And even that black newspaper probably would have been fairly middle class. You know, it, it, it wouldn't have been a black power advocate newspaper, but it would have been more sympathetic yeah. to, I, I, I think, um, the militants in the city. It wouldn't have portrayed them as, as the way they were at the time. Yeah. And probably 40 years later when the trial comes up, too, I think. Um, I don't know the politics of your that's community at all. <laughs> But, yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's that good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fair. Um, yeah. But I, don't, I, I think that's pretty common, and you have to ask this, what are the structural no, reasons? And that's, that's why why city politics, they're fighting over yeah. this de that's, that's decreasing why pie. That earlier, yeah. was like, you know, knowing what will happen, and this, I hate to say it because he was even framed yesterday in a basketball reference, but it's like you die and be a hero, and you live long enough to see yourself become a villain, it was, like, oh. it was in the Batman film. <laughs> And that's kind of what uh, happened to him um, in a lot of ways, where it was like he outlived his heroism for what he was built up to. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was kind of um, uh, taken out of context because we talked about like things that he was credited for, like the baseball and a lot of the big economic rise of downtown. But then it was like, come to find out, that was actually the next administration and everything, but they always acted like he got the ball moving. So Robertson you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, um, and that's what we said. Like you see a town like this, and then people's just thinking of just for just not wanting to think about those things. And you know, you elected this guy who many in the black community always knew that he was involved in some way. And just because I like to talk, so I'll just end with this. Then yeah. kind of thing. so I think the problems. I don't think the focus should just be on him. No, it's not. I mean, I, I, I it's definitely to not. a certain degree. I think the view that maybe one of the reasons it. They didn't go after him then, is because it would lead to um, an understanding that it wasn't just Charlie Robertson. He wasn't just some rogue cop. You know, even down to the state troopers, even down to the White National Guard. I mean, there doesn't seem to be this kind of this buddy buddy system that yeah. exists. And it's, I don't think it's a conscious cover up, but I think there's an unconscious cover up that takes place. And I'm finding the same thing in looking at this Ralph Featherstone stuff. Mm -hmm. The people who um, in, in the Featherstone case I'm looking at, who are doing as little as possible to investigate alternative explanations, become the head of the state troopers and the old police. They're, you know, they move up the ladder. Charlie Robertson moves up the ladder yeah. um, because there probably were other people who, who, who didn't want their feathers ruffled either. You know, mm -hmm. I think I think I got to be careful there because there are those. What's the book? The Wrong Car. There's a book I don't know if you know the Wrong yeah. Car, yeah, which yeah, made Vera know. get a little too conspiratorial. You know, he's going in angles that I don't know about. Um, but I don't think that's, even if you don't believe in conspiracy theory, you can't accept the idea that Robertson is more of a symptom than the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just of, of police at the time. And still to Yeah, and still to I, I, know, I was at a session, you know, people asked a question about, well, and I don't live in it, you know, what percentage of the police are black now? And it's it's still it's abysmally low. low. Yeah. You know, what, what are the reasons for that? And you can say, well, there's individual people who are discriminating, but also 
It's because what's the structure that feeds into these police forces in the first place? Why hasn't someone tried to address that? Yeah. It's the pay, if you ask me. <laughs> Pay's too bad. I mean, 40, I mean, it's like 40, 44 or something like that. Mm. Yeah, but they, they don't tell you, that, at least in Baltimore, they make $165,000 in overtime. So, uh, oh. you know, I mean, it's a dangerous job. The pay's bad. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I th yeah, there's more to it than There's more to it than, than that. that but, yeah. But, I just, but, but some people do it. I mean, I, I teach it in school. Everyone wants to be a cop. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. But, you know, the criminal justice is like the biggest major. But uh, yeah. they have been raised. Part of it's just family network. That's what my uncle did and my brother. Yeah. So... How do you begin to establish that you What's, know, as a viable career? What does the diversity look like in that major? It's not great, yeah. as far as I can tell. But it may not be that disproportionate from the school. True. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I, I teach a freshman seminar course called Race and Justice. So the, the school, it, it's gotten better. The school's probably like 6% African American, maybe 4 or 5% Hispanic now. Um, that course is usually about 50% minority. Uh, and a bunch of them want to be criminal justice majors. Huh. Whether they want to be cops, I don't know. They're interested right, in, in the subject matter. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So maybe they want to be. They want to be the good cops. I think. Yeah. That's my hope. We need them. That's good.